olibanum, frankincense, myrrh, patchouli, geranium, and broxen. What do all these notes actually mean? When you go to research any fragrance on Fragrantica and you see the note breakdown, you will often wonder to yourself, what do these individual notes actually smell like? They're very hard for us consumers to isolate in a lab and actually experience them to know what they're like on their own. So I decided I'd make this video where I explain some of the most common perfume notes in the community that aren't very obvious ones like orange or leather. You can usually wrap your brain around those ones, but it's gonna be around these other perfume notes instead. For example, you're going to be researching a fragrance like Davidoff Cool Water, and you see a note called Calone, and you think to yourself, what the hell is a Calone? But then you see green notes. Ah, oh, yes, I know what green smells like, and that can mean a lot of different things for different people. In this video, I'm going to be covering five different fragrance notes that are very common in the fragrance industry. As I said, notes that are difficult to try and wrap your, your brain around. Most people haven't smelled a tonka bean in their lives, so they, they're not gonna necessarily know off the bat what it is. Just, your brain sort of picks these scents up as you experience many different fragrances with the note of tonka bean, but it takes time and in the end of the day, you still haven't isolated it by itself and smelled it by itself. I do have perfume oils myself in my room, which does help me learn these notes. That is sort of the best way to really uh, develop your nose and appreciate these different notes. So we're gonna go through five different notes. Let's start off with geranium. Geranium has hundreds of different species that exist in the world, but only a handful are used for perfumery. The most common variant is the rose geranium that is native to South Africa. And based on the name, you guessed it, the chemical composition of geranium is very similar to that of rose. I would say on the oil that I have in my room, geranium smells like a more bright, less feminine type of rose. It's, it's floral, rosy, bright, I would say a bit minty, and has lychee facets to it as well. It has great versatility to a lot of perfumes. First of all, it's much cheaper than rose oil, so a lot of perfumers substitute that to recreate their scent of rose, but at a cheaper price. Um, it's used in men's perfumery often as well. When it's used in high concentrations, it smells like a very floral fragrance, of course. It can be used in feminine perfumes when it's dosed that high. But in smaller dosages, and for our purpose in today's video, it is used very commonly in the Fougere family. Fougere is synonymous with a barbershop scent DNA. Created in 1882 in Fougere Royale by Ubijon. This is a fragrance family that smells clean, hygienic, associated with men's perfumery. A great example of this geranium in a Fougere is this. As I said, Fougere Royale by Ubijon. My French is terrible, excuse me, but in 1882, I believe this is the first ever Fougere fragrance ever created. This started off the fragrance family for mainly men's perfumery, created by Paul Parquet, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. 1882 was shortly after the time that coumarin was isolated from tonka beans. I think, believe it was one of the first synthetic ingredients used in perfumery. Before then, it was, I think, pretty much all just natural, which creates a lot less flexibility. <laughs> so synthetics are very important in modern perfumery. Fougere Royale does smell like it is the first ever <laughs> Fougere ever created. It does smell very old school. I can imagine someone in the 19th century rocking this. It smells very much like, yeah, it's got the lavender, it's clean. It's like, it's like the most standard Fougere. It is the base standard. And um, this is not the original from 1882. That is now uh, uh, immortalized in the Osmotech in Versailles in France they recreated the, the formula in 2010. In Fougere families, you usually will have things like lavender, of course, sharp and clean, geranium to soften it out, bergamot to make a nice fresh top note, as well as oak moss to give it a nice muskiness and nice masculinity at the base with coumarin, which gives it a nice creamy sweetness that isn't too overpowering usually. That creates your usual Fougera core. There's obviously lots of variations and modern times has changed this family significantly. But this, as I said, smells very manly, regal, elegant. Do I recommend this? Only for people who are really into their perfumery and want to experience history. It smells really, really outdated, but it smells natural. It smells great, actually. It's, it's a cool but bit of history. I'm glad I got this 10 ml. The second fragrance note is one of my favorites in all of perfumery. That is patchouli. That's right, the hippie favorite note out there that a lot of, basically a lot of hippies used to wear this. Uh, I, I think maybe they just literally took essential oil and dropped it on themselves uh, because patchouli is, first of all, very natural. 
It's long lasting, strong, and it masks a lot of other scents that hippies might have had on them with all the substances that we're using, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Patchouli is a flowering plant or herb that is actually part of the mint family, mainly found in Southeast Asia. Patchouli has been used for centuries for a variety of functions, including medicine, incense, insect repellent, and of course, in perfume. It is gonna be a very common note because first of all, from what I know, looking at, I looked at the IFRA restrictions, it seems like patchouli is not a restricted item like oak moss. Other ingredients like oak moss really give a big pain in the ass for perfumers because it's very difficult to use, it's very limited, whilst patchouli is considered a more safe ingredient and at the same time still being very long lasting. So you can use it in high doses. I have patchouli oil here. What does it smell like? It smells earthy, green, sweet and dark is how it, I, I would describe it. It smells a little bit medicinal as well. It does, it does remind you of medicine in its pure form, but at the same time, I find it just on its own, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's absolutely one of my favorite perfume notes. It adds a really interesting form of sweetness that still gives your perfume a lot of longevity. When I make my own perfumes, I struggle to make things with longevity and patchouli is an easy remedy to that. What are some famous examples of patchouli-based fragrances? In modern times, I would say one of the best is Coromandel, which is a very patchouli-heavy fragrance that has the balance of brighter top notes from the citruses. It's irisy, powdery. At the same time, it's got gourmand delicious, but not overpowering of white chocolate notes with ambers in there. It's a beautiful signature fragrance that smells extremely elegant, powdery, unisex, very long lasting. But another fragrance I want to mention for patchouli today is our own fragrance, Mr. Fragrance by Atrium Fragrance. Our own fragrance release is based on the blue fragrance family DNA. With most blue fragrances, what you have is going to have a sharp citrus at the top to give you that nice freshness, some woods in the middle, and then you're going to get have some ambers in the bottom. And most blue perfumes use amber-like materials to achieve that warmth to balance out that blue DNA. Mr. Fragrance, it does have ambergris in it, so it does have some ambergris, does, <laughs> we'll come to ambergris in a second, but it does have some amber-like amber material in there. But the main sweet sweetness here, which gives it more greenness and more naturals in here, is the patchouli. The patchouli has the warmth, the sweetness. It's not as overpowering as patchouli like Coromandel, it's more of a, a balancing act with other ingredients, but here is what differentiates our blue fragrance. Patchouli gives that maturity, that calmness, and Hippies like to use patchouli because back in the day they would recognize it for how it would calm you but also increase your sex drive and it seems like there is some evidence for that. So yeah, patchouli is a great note. I love it and I'm really glad it's in our own release. This is a lim limited edition batch by the way guys. So this is our only batch of Mr. Fragrance. If you want to buy it, buy it now and then after that we're going to go to our second release which is also incredible in a different way. But yeah, get Mr. Fragrance whilst he still can. It's got many five-star reviews so far. I'll leave a link in the description. Let's go back to the intro when I was discussing Cologne. By the way, guys, at the end, we're gonna discuss Civette, which is the most interesting uh, note in this video. So make sure to stick around for that. Cologne. Now, when, how did Cologne become created? It's, a, it's definitely not a natural ingredient. It's gone, it's gone very different now. We've gone from patchouli, geranium, naturals to Cologne. It is one of the most recent synthetics and most groundbreaking synthetics discovered that introduced a sea breeze effect to perfumery, created the aquatics family, essentially. It was discovered in 1966 by Pfizer, of all people, who were looking up ketones to try and find a, a, a practical uh, depressant, which actually they made a benzodiazepine, they made Valium, which I did not know <laughs> that's how Valium came to be. Uh, and on the way to doing that, they accidentally discovered this other ketone, um, which was discovered by this perfume group. The, the group was in Pfizer. They're called Cam Camille, Albert and Lelou, C-A-L. And then this is a ketone, so they called it Calone. Hence what, how the name came to be. I thought that was quite interesting. And how Calone can be described is, uh, it smells, what I how I would say, like, like they said, a sea breeze. It smells like water from the ocean when you're standing next to it, and it's very strange. You know, tap water, you wanna say water has a smell, but you do kinda of know what I mean when you, when you stand next to the ocean. It smells marine, airy, fresh. It also has another name of being called a watermelon ketone, because it does have watermelon aspects to it. I think in the opening it does. When you first apply the cologne to your uh, paper blotter, you get that watermelon freshness to it. As it dries down, actually, I think you get more of a cucumber facet to it. So I think the more diluted the cologne is, it's, more, it's gonna smell more like cucumber. So oceanic cucumber, 
little bit of watermelon, and that's probably it's probably very much present in fragrances like Nautica Voyage. But we're gonna go back to the pioneer, that is, of course, the original Davidoff Cool Water. Not the first fragrance to have Cologne. I believe that honor goes to Aramis New West, which I'm not sure if that still exists as a fragrance, but this definitely was one of the founding pioneers of Cologne, and pretty much set off the the trend of Cologne of aquatic fragrances, this very airy, transparent, loud aquaticness you find in the 90s. Whenever I smell Cologne Pure, it does literally transport me to like a Hollister shop. I feel like you're in Hollister. Um, it, it's a Hollister isn't necessarily in the 90s, but I feel like that's you know what inspired a Hollister style, Abercrombie and Fitch. Those a lot of perfumes and mainstream perfumery still have that strong aquatic character from Cologne. It's not as prominent as, as it used to be but it's definitely, definitely changed history. I think it's probably been toned down in Davidoff Cool Water. Uh, I think most perfumes now, if they've been reformulated, they tone down the cologne because it just isn't too modern taste anymore. It does smell a bit outdated. That's the problem with synthetic materials. They can become outdated very easily, uh, whilst naturals are more timeless. That's why I think fragrances like Sauvage, it's easier to become more outdated because of the ambroxan in there, which is a synthetic material. Do I need to explain cool water? Most people have smelled it. It's soapy, musky, green, mixed with oceanic notes. Uh, it's a classic. Um, it is synthetic. It, it's very cheap, but it's good for the price tag, I would say. Good longevity, six to eight hours. We started off with naturals, then went to synthetic molecules. Now we're going to go on to the animal products, what are called the animal products in perfumery. These are things like musks, castorium, civet, and in this selection here, in this part of the video, we're going to talk about ambergris. Ambergris is famous in the perfume world. A lot of people think they can become rich from it, <laughs> essentially by discovering a big lump of it on the seashore. Uh, that is uh, well, how a lot of people used to be <laughs> become rich from it in the early days. Um, nowadays, in, in the perfume industry, like with most animal products, they're trying to phase out um, using ambergris in general, uh, just because it's been associated with sperm whale hunting. That is where ambergris comes from. It's unclear exactly how ambergris is formed, but it's believed to be an intestinal secretion inside a sperm whale to protect its intestines from tough things like squid beaks and cuttlefish. So yeah, it gets, they're chewing on very tough and dangerous things, those sperm whales. Uh, I believe it's the only animal that produces ambergris, so somehow that excretion comes out and they, they can be small amounts come out or large amounts. Apparently in the 1600s they discovered a 600 kilogram a big block of ambergris, if I'm remembering correctly, which is crazy. <laughs> they must have become very rich from that. Ambergris is highly valued because it is has it does have a beautiful smell. How I would describe ambergris, which I have a synthetic replica, as most, most perfumes are synthetic replications of it now, which I think is the right way to go. Uh, it, I would describe ambergris as sharp, clean, musky, a little bit animalic. It has that amber-like facet to it. It's got some warmth in there, which is beautiful, hence the name ambergris. And then it also has, uh, what I would say, a marine-like quality to it. Again, reminds you of the ocean, which is just in, 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 amazing, actually. It's crazy that your nose would associate, like, whale, like a sea creature's in, insides with the ocean. It, I think it's beautiful. And I'm very glad that they, that, you know, sperm whales aren't hunted anymore for this, or they're trying to phase it out anyways. I'm, I'm sure it still goes on, but it shouldn't go on, really, because I think, I think sperm whales are becoming more in danger now, like most beautiful species on this planet, and it's very sad. Um, but let's focus on what perfume would include ambergris in it. Of course, I have to bring up Creed Aventus. Creed Aventus used to be a much better smelling perfume, and I think a lot of people hate the fact it's been reformulated, and I think potentially, I'm not sure, I do not know at all, but maybe they went from animal ambergris to the synthetic replication. I would imagine it'd be a lot cheaper that way, um, but I don't think it's an excuse for how flat it smells now. Before it used to be more effervescent, sparkly, smoky, woody, pineapple, great uh, fragrance DNA. The concept is fantastic. It revolutionized the industry. And most uh, Creed fragrances have had that ambergris. I think, I think just that ambergris note will smell a bit more realistic there. We have ambergris and Mr. Fragrance, and I feel like they, it, like our perfumer, <laughs> John Stephen, did it much better uh, than, I'm, like, I'm sure there's probably several different synthetic replications of ambergris. Um, you know, it should give you that muskiness, that longevity. It's a great base. It gives you great, a great fixative to, for the other ingredients to stick to. Um, but I feel like it just doesn't really work here in Creed any longer. It's definitely still there. It's definitely got that, that cleanness, that muskiness, that marine-like 
aspect to it that really just plays with the rest of the notes. The beautiful notes, uh, I just wish, I wish Creed did it better somehow. I don't know how though. <laughs> and finally, let's talk about Civette, another controversial animal product traditionally in perfumery. So as far as I know, the UK and the EU are, are making uh, animal testing or have already made all animal testing for perfumes illegal and they've made all animal products illegal. I think in the UK at the very least. I'm unclear about that. Don't quote me on that. Um, but there are still apparently some countries that IFRA has recognized still use animal testing and I believe some countries still use animal products. But most mainstream brands have phased out animal products because of the history of abuse. Civette is one of those things. What is Civette the perfume note? Civette refers to a perfume note as well as the animal that it comes from. A Civette cat uh, actually is not a cat. It's, it's sort of like it's a small mammal. It's sort of like a, a, a possum that uh, lives mainly in Ethiopia, I believe. And um, it's been used since the 10th century by Arabs. So. Uh, I don't want to take credit for this one as an Arab, uh, but apparently, I'm not sure who the first person, I, I, I couldn't find out online who the first person who um, decided to try civets was, but someone decided that the uh, perianal gland that uh, civets used to secrete a, a, a waxy substance to mark their territory, they thought it smelled great if diluted greatly. Uh, in its pure form, civet is fecal, it's it, it stinky, <laughs> it's, apparently it's, you know, strongly smells of urine, which is fair enough, it's used to mark territory, so you guys can imagine like, why it smells like that. But uh, early in these, in these earlier times, people discovered that if you dilute it enough, it adds a nice radiance to your other notes, it adds a nice warmth to a fragrance, some sweetness. I would say that is true. It's beautiful when you use it in tiny amounts. Even this synthetic replica I have now in my room, in its pure form, it smells horrible, very fecal, dirty, and they probably recreate it now synthetically by using indole, a chemical found in jasmine to create that animalic smell to it. So it's animalic, sweet, warm, and radiant, which is beautiful and used in the right amounts. So vintage formulations like of Guerlain's Jicky which used to use civets had to be reformulated when political activists discovered and exposed the abusive practices behind the civet note as essentially what what poachers would do they would bring the civet animal put them in cages and put them in there for years pretty much their entire lives to stress them out so they can produce that gland it's a horribly abusive practice i'm glad it's being phased out i'm i'm sure probably happens a little bit still in, uh, in, in Ethiopia, but I really do hope it just gets phased out completely. But of course, we still have to talk about a fragrance that has a big dose of civet in it. That is YSL's Kuros. Classic in the community. It uses that fougere like DNA I was talking about before, adds a big dose of civet. Dirty, animalic, rugged, manly. This is like an 80s powerhouse fragrance that doesn't really exist nowadays. Civette isn't really accepted as much in modern time perfumery, which is a shame because I do think it does add a lot of character. You really don't find many perfumes that won't make you a bit stinky. Something about that just is just cool. Like, like you're a man, you don't care if you stink a little bit. Um, but you know, in perfumery, a lot of times in perfumery, it won't be used as heavily as in Kuro, so it will smell a little bit less animalic. And the, as I said, the tiny, just a tiny, tiny amount, because it's so strong, perfumers can create that warmth, that radiance that can be used with other notes like florals. So Civet used to be used with sheep fragrances, used with florals to add radiance, to brighten it up, and the stinkiness would be balanced out by the warmth of those florals. Kuro is still a masterpiece. It goes more to the dirty, animalic, but still fresh and clean side of Civet but I still love it and I think it still deserves to be a top seller in the brand. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I tried to make it very educational. There's a lot of reading and research about these different perfume notes, the plants. So hopefully we can learn about nature, learn about how you know some animal products are very abusive. Of course, I've only just, uh, explained five different ingredients here. I can obviously go into a lot more ingredients. Would you guys like to see more parts of the series and which notes specifically would you like to see? Leave your suggestions down in the comments down below. Did you find anything interesting or did you discover something new from this information? If you did, let me know guys, because you know I, I definitely learned a lot from researching this video. Thank you for watching guys. Make sure to check out our other content on perfume notes and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.